little over one year ago, U.S. Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was on a patrol in southern Arizona with a Vortac team. Their mission was to go out and find Mexican banditos that were preying on people who were coming illegally into the United States and also on drug smugglers doing robberies and murders and things like that. They came upon a team and got engaged in a firefight with the banditos. And during that firefight, Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was killed. Subsequent to that, we later learned that some of the weapons involved in that firefight used by the drug gangs were in fact guns that had been purchased through an operation by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms called Fast and Furious. We found out about this because of some whistleblowers who came forward to Senator Charles Grassley from Iowa. After several months of reporting by Texas GOP Vote and other bloggers across the nation, finally the media got involved in the story in mid-February to March and the scandal has grown to uh, giant proportions as we as we move forward with it. Recently, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder was called before the, the House Judiciary Committee to answer questions about his involvement in Operation Fast and Furious as head of the Justice Department. And today we're going to speak with U.S. Congressman Ted Poe from the 2nd Congressional District of Texas about his experience in this hearing with uh, Attorney General Eric Holder. So today we'll speak with Congressman Poe and find out what really happened in this hearing. Congressman Poe, thank you for taking time this morning to talk with the readers of Texas GOP Vote, and we appreciate your, your access and your time as we've had in the past. I'd like to talk to you this morning about the hearing that you had recently with U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder in the Fast and Furious operation. What were your impressions from the hearing and speaking with General Holder? The more I learned from uh, Attorney General Holder, the more I was concerned and am concerned about this whole operation. The idea that the United States would smuggle automatic weapons to our neighbor, Mexico, give them to the drug cartels, the enemy of Mexico and the enemy of the United States, 2,000 weapons, most of which have been unaccounted for, is nonsense. How would we ever make such a decision? All under the guise of, well, we're going to track these weapons and see where they turn up. Well, they turned up where they were supposed to, the drug cartels. And uh, 200 Mexican nationals have died. At least two Americans have died. Eric Holder said several things that were interesting. One, I didn't know about it. I didn't get the memo. I got the memo. I didn't read the memo. Now, his experience about not reading important documents like the health care, I mean the Arizona immigration law, like he testified before Congress before us last year. Uh, he hadn't read it, started talking about how bad it was. Uh, I'm not surprised if he hadn't read the memo, but he knew about it, he was in charge. The second thing he said was that more people are going to die. That's awful. More Mexican nationals, maybe more Americans. And then the third thing he said that I thought was preposterous I asked him, who was in charge? Who made the decision in our government to do this whole thing of smuggling guns to Mexico? I don't know. He said, I don't know. And here we have almost a year after investigation in the Justice Department with all their lawyers and all their law enforcement officers. They don't know who made this decision. I think that was a little uh, preposterous that he would make that statement. Preposterous is exactly the word that was coming to mind for me as well. I, I just can't believe with all the investigations that have been done in this that there's no knowledge about who would have approved such a, a, a operation of such magnitude. You know, that you would think there would be very clear delineation of who approved something like that. Well, the way the federal bureaucracy works, there's a record of everything. You know, you can't order a pencil in the federal government without several people signing off on the paperwork and to make a statement that he doesn't know who was in charge. So either he did know, or if he didn't know, there, is there a rogue operation going on in our government that smuggles guns to our neighbors, Mexico? Is, is that what's going on? And so, how come it's taken him so long to find out who these rogue moles are that uh, are so insistent in getting these weapons uh, to, our, to, uh, to the drug cartel? And, and these are not just pistols. These are semi-automatic rifles. And they're sniper rifles, and sniper rifles, including some 50 caliber, and 50 caliber uh, 
weapons as well. So uh, this is very serious. Uh, the Mexican government uh, should be rightfully concerned. Americans should be rightfully concerned. Did the, the Attorney General speak under oath? When a person testifies before the Judiciary Committee by agreeing to testify and signing a form that you will testify uh, under our rules, that person is under oath. He was not actually sworn in the, the hearing. Uh, that came up in the hearing, but he was con he's considered to be under oath for all the statements he made. Okay. We have a, a history, a track record of the Justice Department lying to Congress through uh, the Deputy Attorney General in a letter that he wrote to Senator Grassley which was later proven to be blatantly false. Um, did you see anything in the testimony that you felt was false testimony? Well, the, the defense was all of the above. Uh, you know, it wasn't me. I wasn't there. If I was there, I didn't do it. Yeah, if I did do it, I acted in self-defense. I mean, it, had, it held all the defenses. Uh, the, uh, one of the statements that had been made to Congress, the, the Justice Department withdrew that statement, said it was made in error. They wouldn't say they, they lied, they just said it was made in error. But we've gotten all kinds of different uh, information. We have subpoenaed numerous documents from the Justice Department about Fast and Furious. We've gotten a little bit. We're going to press that issue. But it's interesting of the memos that we've gotten, we haven't gotten any from Eric Holder. No emails from Eric Holder. It's from other people. You know, but not air cold. So he won't release his his personal communications on this topic. Not yet. We're going to press that issue. Okay. We're going to go back into session. How do we move this forward and and get some resolution to what really happened with Fast and Furious? Well, the judicial department or the uh, judici judiciary committee under Lamar Smith uh, will have more hearings. We're going to have more subpoena. We're going to get these documents. We're going to get them the lawful, legal way. We're going to get the documents. This is not going away. Even though mainstream media doesn't want to talk about this uh, issue, uh, we will get the documents and we will follow uh, appropriate legal procedures to get the documents. We're going to have more hearings. We'll get to see Attorney General Holder again next year and some of his deputies. And maybe we'll find out who these rogue operatives are. Now, you have called for the Attorney General's resignation. If this information moves forward in the way that it looks like it's moving forward, would you support impeachment hearings against the Attorney General if he refuses to resign? Impeachment sounds great. It will never work. Uh, it, it takes too long to impeach anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time the impeachment process took place in the House, the election would be here in November. Uh, and realistically, the Senate would never convict and remove Eric Holder from office. It sounds good, but it's not feasible. Uh, he, he needs to uh, immediately resign. And the secondary thing, that the president has to appoint an independent counsel to investigate the ATF and investigate the Justice Department. We're going to get that investigation after the next president uh, is in office. But uh, like I said, impeachment sounds good. Uh, there are some that want impeachment. It, it won't go very far. It takes too long. Unfortunately, it does. But we need to make sure that we hold Eric Holder accountable for these actions. How do we hold him accountable if he refuses to bring forward the documents that you need to thoroughly investigate? He can always be held in contempt of Congress. Then it gets real serious. You know, I was a former judge, and uh, when you hold somebody in contempt, you usually get their attention. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The uh, excuses that he gave you probably sounded a lot like things you would have heard when you were a criminal court judge. Oh yes, it was, it, those were very similar to excuses uh, and they were excuses for uh, conduct, improper conduct. The Attorney General is accountable for this action. Whether he was in charge, he was in charge, but whether he made the decision or somebody else, he was the man that was in charge of this whole Justice Department and the ATF. He should be held personally accountable for these this decision. What did you learn from the hearings that you might not have known before he came to testify? He also made a statement during my questioning of him uh, about the operation itself. Uh, did Mexico know about the operation? And he said, well, they may have known about some of it, but they didn't know to this extent. And then he said, I said, would you agree that this was reckless on the part of the Justice Department, reckless conduct? He said, yes, I'd agree that it's reckless. Of course, 
under Texas law, when you recklessly cause the death of another person, you've committed manslaughter. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that to him, so he backed off that, that a little bit. But this is, this is serious conduct where, where an operation is reckless, our government promotes it in a foreign country, and, and people have died because of American conduct. In regards to the murder of Brian Terry, what is happening in that case in, in terms of charges and arrests against people? I know the Justice Department allowed several of the key witnesses in that case to be deported from the country so that they weren't available for questioning. No kidding. They went back where they came from. Uh, this is a an old-fashioned law enforcement technique. Now, it is valid generally that they can't give you information because the investigation is ongoing. I've heard that from peace officers before. Generally, that is true because they're working with witnesses and they're trying to get information from witnesses. And, uh, but that's, their, that's what they're saying about this. We can't tell you anything. It's an ongoing investigation. So if they ever complete the investigation, we'll get more information. But here, this has been almost a year. Mm -hmm. And they can't solve a case in a year. Uh, it, it shows a lack of competence on the part of the Justice Department, if that's true. I suspect they probably know a whole lot more than they're revealing. And uh, it'll eventually occur where they will have to say, we finished the investigation. We'll get all the information the American public will. I suspect what we're going to find is at least one, maybe two of the weapons found at the scene were those weapons that were part of Fast and Furious that went to Mexico, came back to the United States, and one of them was used to murder Brian Terry. And also the ICE agent who was killed in Mexico was also related to Fast and Furious? Yes, Jaime Zapata that was uh, killed, uh, an ICE agent killed in uh, Mexico, who was unarmed when he was ambushed. He and his partner were ambushed. Uh, I think the same would be true that a weapon in Fast and Furious was used in that homicide. Have you had the opportunity to speak to the family of Brian Terry? Not, uh, not recently. Just at last year. I'm just curious how they're holding up with the, the strain of, of this ongoing not knowing really what happened. I think they are like most victims. They want this thing resolved and they want the truth uh, to, to come out. And I, I admire them for pressing the issue and including the issue of how Brian Terry was armed. Uh, it looks like that he was had to shoot or did fire bean bags at these uh, drug cartel members, and that may be also responsible, partly responsible for how he was not able to defend himself. Now, who made that decision? We hear conflicting information about that. Now, um, in regards to that, do you think the reason for that policy might be because of some of the aggressive prosecutions that have happened in the past against Border Patrol agents who've used deadly force weapons in these circumstances? No, we have another one. Uh, uh, Agent Diaz has already been prosecuted for being uh, allegedly a little too rough with somebody when he handcuffed him, and so he goes to jail, the, uh, the drug smuggler goes free. Uh, I long thought that the federal government in the Western District of Texas uh, was on the wrong side of the, of the border war in these cases, and that they seem to go, uh, go after border agents that are trying to protect the country over trying to uh, protect and defend the border agents' actions. They find fault with their actions. And what I've learned and heard about uh, uh, Agent Diaz's actions, uh, I don't think it was worth uh, something that should have been prosecuted and letting the drug dealer go. They should have dealt with him in an uh, administrative way and prosecuted the drug dealer. Mm -hmm. But no, they sent him to jail and let the drug dealer go free. And I believe he got 25 months in, in solitary confinement in prison. And he's incarcerated now. Right. And recently they've moved him to another prison where his family can't even come visit him anymore. He, he's, he's isolated and it's, uh, I, I think it's improper. He should have been dealt with it administratively based upon the allegations against him if they were true, mm -hmm. not uh, sent to prison. But it, it's a symptom of the federal government and it sends a message to the Border Patrol agents who I've talked to on the border, that uh, if you get in a situation where you have to make a split-second decision to defend your life or protect the country or this person is armed or going to cause you some 
uh, danger, they hesitate. And that hesitation is, is what's serious. I know of at least two Border Patrol agents who are dead now because of, of some type of hesitation, the first being a couple of years ago when a Border Patrol agent was run down by a vehicle on the border when he possibly could have drawn his weapon and defended himself and, and didn't. And uh, you may be talking about the same agent who put out the spikes mm -hmm. for the, uh, the pickup truck that was headed back to Mexico and rather than use his weapon uh, to stop the truck, he put the spikes out and the guy in the pickup truck uh, drove off the road and ran over him, killed him, and then went on back to Mexico. One final question. When we spoke last time, we talked about your program that you have offered legislation on that would put National Guard troops on the border under the direction of the border state governors, but paid for by the federal government. Is there any movement on that issue? That legislation's in committee. We want to pursue that legislation. Uh, the number one job of the federal government is actually to uh, protect the United States, national security. Border security is a national security issue. Uh, the Border Patrol, the sheriffs on the border, they need the help. National Guard uh, is the answer, in my opinion, and they put them on the board, 10, uh, border, 10,000 of them, uh, at the request of the four state governors and supervised by the governors, paid for by the federal government. We hope to move that next year. Now, the Obama administration this week announced that they were pulling back troop, National Guard troops from the border and going to replace them with aircraft and uh, airborne reconnaissance type operations. Do you think that's the right move for them to make? No, it's not wise at all. There are only 1,200 National Guard troops on the border anyway. Now the administration wants to reduce it to 300 and they're now calling it boots in the air, whatever that means, uh, to have the National Guard uh, use some type of air support on the border. Doesn't make it clear whether there would be new additional aircraft and they're woefully ac uh, inaccurate, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they don't have enough aircraft already fixed wing or helicopters on the border. Uh, so uh, that's not the answer to just fly and notice people coming across the border. You've got to actually stop them. It's not a, not a wise decision, I think. And uh, bipartisan way, we sent the president a letter, several of us asking him not to remove these troops, but he's done it anyway. It'd be nice to have that drone back that they left parked in Iran and <laughs> put it down on the Texas border. Well, we need everything. We do need uh, more troops on the ground. We do need more fixed wing and helicopters uh, to patrol the border and we need to help work with the border patrol. But now is not a time to back off of national security. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to the readers of Texas GOP vote this morning? Well the the one issue is specifically about the border. Homeland Security says oh the border is great you know it's it's a lovely place uh, and safe. Uh, but their own statistics, the GAO, uh, has already said that only 44% of the border is secure. That means 56% is not secure. Who controls that? It's not Mexico. It's not the United States. It's the bad guys. So yes, there are some portions of the border that are safe. Some of the big cities uh, on the border on the American side are safe. But it's between the points of legal entry where it's not safe. And the idea that uh, we, we call 44% a success. Uh, only the federal government would do that, and it's unfortunate because border security is an issue that the federal government needs to deal with, should have dealt with years ago. I do feel much better now because they have set up an unmanned checkpoint <laughs> yes. where, where we can use the honor system to come <laughs> That's in and right. scan the documents. That's right. Is, so they're doing a great job for us. <laughs> Congressman, thank you for your time this morning and for the work that you're doing for the American people on this fast and furious operation. I think this is one of the worst scandals in Justice Department history, and I hope you can get to the bottom of it. We're not going to let it go away. We're going to find out the truth. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Much.